coronavirus hospitalizations in the U.S. have reached an all-time high, with more than 60,000 patients admitted for treatment nationwide. And as you just heard from David, reported 17 states are experiencing record high hospitalizations. That's prompting officials in states like Utah and Nebraska to issue more restrictions. Meanwhile, a new analysis of insurance claims data by Fair Health finds people living with intellectual and developmental challenges are three times more likely to die from COVID-19 compared with patients without those conditions. So for more on this, let's bring in Dr. Nita Ogden. She's an internal medicine specialist and immunologist. So doctor, this is so troubling. Hospitals across the U.S. are seeing an influx in COVID-19 cases. The great news that we heard from Pfizer and Eli Lilly about a vaccine and possible, uh, you know, rep, um, remedies for this this virus are buttressed by the state of the country right now. Uh, and so, when you see these surging infections, hospitals that don't have any room for people that are sick, what does it say to you about the state of the pandemic? You know, it's humbling to see these numbers uh, because I think people need to realize that the coronavirus doesn't magically disappear, that we've led to be been believed by, you know, certain people in power. And uh, they're, they're legislators who basically did not take it seriously enough. There was a downplaying of the virus, and this has now led to places where there wasn't a, a real enforcement of masks, seeing these high surges. And it's it's a dark time, even with the positive news of the vaccine and the antibody therapy on the horizon. Uh, it's really a message to the country that we still need to very much wear masks, social distance, stay away from indoor settings, uh, stay away from those places that we know coronavirus does really well, and use those measures that we know are effective in combating it. Uh, I think it's that kind of sort of downplaying and, and disregard for these measures that has ultimately led to these surges. And it's very concerning in terms of how these hospitals are really on um, their brink in terms of capacity and resources. So, doctor, you know, we just ran a story uh, that David Begno did where he focused on a young man with Down syndrome who succumbed to COVID-19. But his mother really stressed that he was really vigilant when it came to avoiding the virus, that he that he followed all the guidelines. So I want to ask you about this analysis by Fair Health, which claims that individuals living with intellectual and developmental challenges are three times more likely to die of COVID-19. Um, we should point out that this analysis is of an academic nature. It has not appeared in a uh, medical publication. But from your experience, how does the virus impact people who are already dealing with these sorts of challenges? Yeah, without a doubt, this is a vulnerable patient population. First of all, many of them uh, live in congregate settings where we know that the coronavirus can spread very quickly. They also depend on teachers aides and therapists who now have to maintain uh, a distance of six feet. And if you think about situations where there are lockdowns, they may not be able to even access those aids. So there's such a, a, a you know, a decrease in the amount of progress they can make in terms of their skills, because that's such a regular part of their therapy and improvement. Uh, and finally, people needs with de developmental disabilities and intellectual disabilities, uh, many of them, have, such as Down syndrome, have underlying medical conditions. Uh, they're more predisposed to respiratory infections and pneumonia. So what might look like a mild illness in somebody else could quickly turn into a pneumonia in somebody in this category. And so this really sheds light, this analysis, on who should be in that category of people who get the early vaccine uh, and how the government and uh, legislators are going to distribute it based on these kind of underlying health problems, because these patients may not be able to articulate as well when they're not feeling well, when they have symptoms. And so how are we going to, you know, get them access to um, medical care if they're not able to articulate those things? That may be part of the problem here and why, why, why we've seen in this analysis three times more likely to die from COVID-19. So this is part of the landscape of the vaccine as well, and which of those vulnerable populations uh, are most in need of it urgently. So I mentioned Pfizer and their vaccine, which they say is 90% effective. Dr. Fauci believes Americans should be able to receive vaccines by the spring. What would that distribution look like? 
So the CDC has outlined uh, categories and stages of who would get the vaccine. And again, in that first category are people with underlying medical conditions, such as, um, you know, diabetes and high blood pressure, people that we saw uh, and continue to see succumb to COVID-19 in a more severe way. Also, healthcare workers, older people over 65 years of age and older really who live in congregate settings. So this would be like the first stage. Um, and then people who are more on frontline in a different way uh, that are essential to commerce or teachers, for example. And then there would sort of be the rest of us scenarios. So I think that that's how it's kind of laid out. And I think there's a lot of positivity about the virus and the vaccines are coming out. But um, one has to keep in mind that the Pfizer vaccine, I think a lot of people have heard at this point, has to be stored at incredibly cold temperature below 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so, you know, if you read about uh, vaccine administrators, they're sort of scratching their heads in a very intense way about how this is actually practically going to play out uh, across the country. And um, the same thing goes with the antibody therapy from Eli Lilly. This is an IV infusion uh, that's been approved for people with, you know, know, a more mild disease. Well, where are these people going to get it so that they don't infect other people? There's a lot of inf infrastructure here um, that may play out well in, you know, um, like academic medical centers that have a lot of resources. But what about the rest of the country? So these are all questions um, that really that scaffolding that has to be addressed. It's uh, great to talk about a vaccine that has these early results. But um, I think it's so important that we now really devote a lot of attention to uh, how it's going to scale out in that way. So listen, doctor, we're just a couple of weeks away from Thanksgiving and we've been reporting on these soaring COVID cases, but you know, a lot of people are not gonna Zoom their Thanksgiving dinner. They're just not gonna do it. They're gonna think of this as a time where there's an exception. They're gonna focus on all the times that they wore their masks and wash their hands and argue that the people that are close to them, they know exactly, you know, how they're behaving. Um, so I want to ask you for some advice moving forward, looking at the holidays. And I want to sort of point out to people that in some areas, in some states, small gatherings are permitted indoors. Um, but sometimes those small gatherings are like 50 people. So that doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, the, the precautions are the best. Um, so what advice do you have for people who may be thinking about traveling for the holidays, who, who just, you know, they haven't seen their loved ones in a long time and they're thinking about making an exception for Thanksgiving? Listen, I think it's a really difficult time um, where we will likely not see our loved ones during the holidays. And people just have to keep in mind that with this great news of the vaccine and these therapies ahead of us, I think there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And if we can just get through this really dark period, um, we will get out on the other side. It's really about not getting sick and infecting your family members during this holiday season. A group of 50 people indoors is highly concerning. Nobody should do it. Uh, unless you have access, and nobody has access to this, uh, a, a very uh, sensitive and specific test that you can take the minute before you walk into your family gathering, forget about it. It's just not happening because it's you just can't account for, as you said, where people have been and what their exposures have been, especially with such a large group. I recommend that people during Thanksgiving and the holidays really stick with their immediate family. And that's the way that it's going to be the safest for them. There's really no way around it. We don't have a uh, you know, testing in place that would allow us to do things like more freely. And when you see what's happening in the Midwest, uh, you know, if somebody does get uh, COVID and they fall sick, now you're potentially entering a very stressed healthcare system that could lead to worse outcomes. So there, there is a real snowball effect here that you have to keep in mind. You really can't throw caution to the wind. Dr. Anita Ogden, great advice. Thank you so much. Thank you.